This is the European edition of Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. We bring you the European unicorn startups, founders, regulators and leaders innovating the rapidly evolving fintech scene today. A truly localized podcast with both English and local language content with some of the world's most well-known hosts and influencers in the fintech sector globally. Join us every week as we explore what makes the European Union a phenomenal proving ground for many of the fastest growing fintech plays in the world today. Okay, let's roll. Welcome everyone. My name is Paolo Cironi and I'm your guest today for episode 178 of uh, Breaking Banks Europe Fintech News Edition. And today I have with me two special guests to discuss what happened recently in the fintech world. First of all, let me bring to stage Sandra Mianda. Sandra, thanks for joining in from the UK. Pleasure. Good afternoon. Lovely. Thank you for having me here, Paolo. Um, so yeah, my name is Sandra Mianda. I run a payment consultancy called Paperwork. Um, I have actually been in business just about 15 months, so I'm very much into that startup mode. Um, but prior to that, I've been about 14 years in the payment industry. I worked across um, kind of established settings, like very large operating banks uh, to smaller player fintechs. And I've kind of worked my way around, you know, from issuing, from um, acquiring to a post solution to then look at uh, some of the most more emerging um, solutions that are coming out there. So yeah, so that's kind of me. And primarily today I work with merchants, helping them figuring things out because it's quite um, an interesting, let's say, market that we live in. So it's kind of like being their voice and helping them comparing Apple to Apple because there's a lot of uh, jargons, um, you know, concept that just crossing between different models. And yeah, it's um, it's pretty tough sometimes to, uh, to make Sense what is the startup mode? That doesn't mean feeling the bit of innovation or being hit by the lack of innovation. <laughs> That's such a funny question. Um, well, I don't know because you know I'm 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 actually represent I'm an advocate of the market, right? So I don't have a product, so I'm not building a product, right? So I'm I'm led by what the market's got to offer and trying to make sense and really bringing the buyers and the seller right in the same room because you know, typically only the usual suspect get the hair time, right? It's always the same names, the ones that have got the big pockets, that have got the most visibility that tend to be, you know, kind of socialized. So, yeah, so for me, you know, to your point with innovation, innovation from the perspective of what's being driven in the market. So myself, I see myself start up because just I am literally, you know, starting up, um, not just yet building a product. If there was a product build, it would be more in the, um, in the learning side of things. So kind of like bringing, um, insight knowledge in a way that um you know that is a, a little bit um you know refreshed and different than the traditional training approach because this um yeah this space is so fast so evolving and uh, there's a lot of outdated information difficult to find sources and everybody needs sure. you know to keep on top of it and Sandra, talking knowledge we also want to talk to monica who has lots of knowledge to share with our audience monica milares welcome from malaysia Thank you, Paolo. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, a bit intro. Um, I basically carved myself a niche career building new banks from scratch, which is very exciting, by the way. Uh, so I my first bank was in the UK when Tandem Bank was just getting started. This is at the same time as Revolut Monzo starting. We were all starting at the same time. So I was like lucky that I kind of like joined the company. I just moved from big bank to the startup world. That was very exciting for a few years until one day I got a call and basically there was the opportunity to move to Asia to replicate the same thing. When fintech in Asia, well, in Southeast Asia was almost non-existent. So basically oh, since then... So fast. Yes, now it's like Asia is booming. So the past six years, almost six years, I've been in Malaysia building BigPay. So I'm part of the founding team in BigPay, which we are a uh, neo bank. We started in Malaysia, now we're in Singapore and growing regionally. And basically we exist because we believe uh, that we can help people manage their money better. Like we can help people level up their lives. And basically people lack discipline. It's not about how much money you make. That's everyone worldwide. It's about how you're managing your money, the discipline, the habits that you have. And then basically we, we're on a mission to 
to help everyone live Sounds their lives and have good. less stress with money. <laughs> Sounds very good. So then, today's episode wants to discuss some of the most recent news in the fintech world with an eye on next week. Next week, Money 2020 Europe will open their amazing stage in Amsterdam. So the question that we are going to address through the fintech news today is what's about the fintech? How do they gather together what's happening around the conferences, how they can improve their chances to strike partnership and be successful. So there are six pieces of news that we want to discuss today. I'm going to share them with you in the audience so that you know what we'll talk and listen carefully to the whole episode because there's a lot that we wanted to discuss together with you. First of all, we're going to talk about Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is spinning off Louisa as a a social media app that wants to enable smart people to connect to do deal making. So very interesting for the startup world to leverage potentially a new channel for making their inroads into the world of the investors and the investments for opportunities. The second discussion would be about Money 2020. Breaking banks in Europe will be present at Money 2020 in Grand Fanfare, like we did for the previous two editions. So I will invite you all to follow what we're doing and we make a reflection about what happens now that the world is back to analog life. And then, if you never heard about X Corp, you want to listen to this episode because we're going to discuss the change of uh, title of Twitter into XCorp and the appointment of the new CEO, what does it mean for the competition in the super app space? Fourth, uh, we want to discuss venture capital. We saw the recent uh, numbers from PitchBook. Uh, the performance of venture capital funds has been negative for the third quarter in a row. No surprise, it has been so uh, stellar for uh, the past few years that the uh, moment of inflection and recognition of reality had to come. But what does it really mean for the startups? Then for the fifth, I think this is the news uh, of the day, which is the no news. No US bank has defaulted over the weekend. And therefore, we want to discuss a reflection about the intersection between digital payments, moving accounts, and a banking run. And last but not least, all eyes on Revolut and the UK regulators for the approval or not of the banking license, what might happen. So we look a bit into the future and what it means for the future of fintech. Now, this is the episode 178. Let's start uh, with Goldman Sachs. As mentioned, Goldman Sachs, uh, um, as an interesting bank, has been investing uh, in the last few years uh, into the digital transformation and the fintech revolution, not only building uh, solutions like Marcus, and then they brought inside uh, the well management business, as they saw the defaults uh, and the credit crisis uh, approaching after the pandemic. But they also created solutions like uh, cards uh, partnering with Apple. So they had to penetrate the market in a variety of ways. But there's one thing that they also did, which I think is interesting for the fintech. There is this app, Luisa, that was born inside Goldman Sachs uh, to help uh, the Goldman Sachs people connect in better ways. Uh, it seems the bankers don't connect easily, if not in front of uh, a drink uh, in the city of London. So through this digital app now, they could basically source uh, more quickly opportunities uh, that facilitate the making. Now, what Goldman Sachs announced uh, some days ago is that the spinning of Luisa to turn it into a fully fledged, uh, and let's see how open, social media to compete with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where we all are discussing business topics. Uh, is a bit generic, if you like, much better, I would say, in terms of the language uh, that people use uh, compared to others, but still uh, is a very broad uh, and undifferentiated uh, uh, social media, not really geared uh, towards deal making. So now we know how hard it is uh, for startups uh, to be seen, to be known, uh, how intense uh, it is to move around, to meet people. So what do you guys think about uh, the need of a new social media app that might facilitate uh, the world of the startup to meet uh, their uh, relevant investors? Let's start from the UK. Well, I think for me, there's a couple of things that resonate um, when I 
so that you use the first piece for me is that, that connectivity that you need for connections right which leads to network this is where it starts from any business perspective right you need to be able to find and to mingle to network within that community that can facilitate um you know your entry to market that can help enhancing your product that, that could be partnership that could be you know so many different angles so that i think is really interesting because it's kind of like really emphasizing the world we live in today right social media that started from a oh you know talking about your clothing or whatever that you're eating to actually really starting to find a much more relevant meaning, even within business community, like you say, with LinkedIn, right? I mean, LinkedIn has always predominantly been about, um, you know, sourcing a new job or kind of keeping the industry up to date about what you're doing, right, from a professional perspective. But what we're also seeing is that increasingly there's a lot more startup voices that are coming out onto LinkedIn and how they're coming and trying to be seen is by starting to share either part of that startup journey or either to share as a part of a, a product build that they kind of involved in or, um, you know, kind of trying to appeal to your VCs or angel investors. So we're starting to see those messages, right, starting to translate within, within LinkedIn, whether or not it's the right place. So there's clearly um, almost like a cry or a need for somehow something that breached that social media interactivity for that community that predominantly looking for, you know, funding for you know platforms to be able to accelerate or push their, 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 their product. So I think there's definitely an interesting play there because there is a need, whether we, we like it or not, that is translated in the industry. The piece that I'm a bit questioning is Goldman Sachs, because like you did say in your introduction, they've been diving in so many different um, you know, projects recently. But would people essentially look at this as a place being, you know, managed and being owned by Goldman Sachs as truly a neutral or the right platform to essentially, you know, sort of come and openly discuss um, and share information that could as well be to a certain extent, be, you know, um, private or probably uh, opening up to competitors or others that have got probably more resources they're longer in the journey to take that model and to probably spin with it and, and roll with it. So I've got a bit of that questions around interesting connectivity, yes, networking, there's a need, you know, the startup industry. Goldman Sachs as being the underlying platform that actually, um, you know, would own and manage this, a bit of question mark, because we are in the era of these decentralizations where people want to own and want to be, um, you know, able to, you know, truly be empowered and, and, and drive with, you know, their content, their information. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, twofold for me. Of course, the Italians know that parmesan doesn't go everywhere uh, on your dishes, but in North America in particular, that's not the rule. And AI and ChatGPT are like the parmesan for Americans are everywhere. So for most of us, they don't forget to mention that this will be powered by artificial intelligence, uh, possibly large language models uh, to basically unleash something more powerful than anything, the collaborative intelligence, they say, of your people. Monica. What's your yes, view? I have a controversial view. Good. I love the idea of having an AI-powered LinkedIn on steroids. That's what their social media says, right? Love it. However, I'm a product person. So I went to their website and I'm like, with all respect, <laughs> it is very confusing what is the product that they are offering. So on one hand, they are saying, hey, we're trying to connect all the knowledge from all the people in your company. On the other hand, they are saying, hey, we're a deal-making platform and we want like, to bring all these companies on board. So it is a bit confusing. And I think what they, they have the technology, right? But they probably have not stepped, they have stepped back, but they could do a better job in saying, what is really the customer that we're serving? Because when we're talking about like the startup ecosystem, it's very different if you're investing in fintechs versus if you're investing in biotech or clean tech. It's just like different things that you're looking for. And VCs and, and angels and everything, they tend to be specialized on vertical. So that's number one. It's like, are you going to focus on all of them in one go? It, it's... Very unclear what's their proposition, actually. 
Uh, and then and if I will... Banker will look at uh, their phone for the Bloomberg screens, so then the Louisa for the making you saying. Yes, it's like, exactly. Like coming back to what Sandra was saying, I've been in the fintech space like for eight years or so. Fundraising is one of the most challenging activities. Why would I go into social media and disclose all my, you know, like all my cards with all my peers? Like fundraising, even though I have not actively been in the game of fundraising, fundraising is very strategic and you need to play it well. And you need to be like, you need to have a strong game. So is this, uh, oh, let's connect VCs with startups? That's fine. But is it going to be like, are you really going to help startups get funding because they are in an AI-powered LinkedIn? Yeah, I am not sure. Plus, the startups need to be good in the first place, right? So I am not sure exactly what's the problem that they are trying to solve. Therefore, what's their proposition? Well, when it comes to digital, even for banks, starting a loan online doesn't mean completing the loan process online, which would be a full digital decision process. So getting a connection on the app might not mean to complete that one on the app. So let's see where they want to put the uh, boundary around uh, these uh, um, user interactions. But then, as we expect that startup, uh, VCs, investors will discuss and connect more and more on digital, like uh, everything else uh, that is going more and more digital in our life, uh, we definitely meet in person at Money 2020 next week, happening in Amsterdam uh, uh, between the 6th and the 8th of June. Now, it's with pride that I remind everyone that Breaking Banks Europe is uh, covering uh, uh, Money 2020 again for the third year in a row, and we have uh, a full team of uh, um, hosts uh, discussing uh, with Money 2020 attendees uh, and speakers uh, all that matters in the fintech uh, um, that is uh, going to be discussed there. And also, I know that Monica is um, also speaking at Money 2020. So let me remind you a little of advertisement here, what we are going to do next week. First of all, I will be the first starting making a book signing of latest bestseller banks and fintech on platform economy, so you can meet on Tuesday the 6th at 11.30 at the Gizek and the Vrient Lounge BR5 for this uh, special moment. Second, what we are going to have uh, is uh, um, Francesca Aliberti speaking uh, on Talk Money 2020, the stand the fabric uh, that is at uh, uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. She will be followed by Monica Milares, and I want to have a conversation with you in a moment about that, as she is going to be on stage at 4.15 to discuss how to think differently in terms of fintech, payments, music, and the audience. So let's wow. uh, hold a moment, uh, guys. Okay, I tell you the whole <laughs> schedule of Breaking Banks Europe, and then I want to hear from Monica what this is all about. Then we have Matteo Rizzi, our executive producer, talking about exits beyond the bull it, and that will happen on June the 7th. On June the 7th, Don Giesel will also discuss empowering fintech in Ukraine, and Matteo will wrap it up uh, the last day, June the 8th, talking about funding the ecosystem. So now, Monica, when I read the title of your talk, uh, fintech, payment, music, and audience, uh, I had the lead starting in my brain uh, that was money to tight to mention. That would be mine. But I guess that for some fintech and unicorn is uh, money too big to invest well. Let me just explain to you here what I'm thinking. Like, uh, I'm amazed by how much money Facebook invested in new ideas like the metaverse. But when I'm on Facebook and I try to share my thoughts, I have such a poor experience in using their chatting tool. And I'm thinking, can it be that too much money does not allow some of these unicorns to focus on what really matters, improving the product? But anyway, what's music has to do with fintech and uh, payments? Yes, it is about thinking differently, like you said. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the trends in fintech, what's happening now, what's happening in the near future. But if we think about how much the industry has been growing, we have diverse backgrounds. People are coming from different 
different industries and different backgrounds into the industry. And we have a responsibility to train everyone such that we can do the best job that we can as an industry to help people with their money, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, one of the ways in which we learn is experiential. Not everyone learns reading or going to the classroom. And if you think about it, like when we were kids, we used to learn with music. So what we're going to do is an experimental session. So I'll be on stage with a DJ and a rapper. Okay. So basically, <laughs> as I talk about the trends of fintech, then the DJ and the rapper, they'll be behind me. And then I, basically we will innovate as we go along and then they, they'll they create like a song and then I'll continue talking about the next trends and then they create the next part of the song. We involve the audience as well because it's experiential, of course. Uh, so you have to be there. Uh, and then at the end of the session, we'll create like this piece of music, let's say like the song of Money 2020 Amsterdam that was co-created by everyone in the audience, myself, DJ and... By the way, I'm not distancing the bachelor of Goldman Sachs. So you know that the CEO of Goldman Sachs is also a well-known DJ. And therefore, <laughs> you might well have him on stage. Eh? If you want to mix and match instead of Louisa. <laughs> opportunities for the startups. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of fintechers that are into DJ and music. So that brings people together as well. Sandra, what's your music for fintech? Oh, goodness. I mean, first of all, I have to say, Monica, hats off. I think it's fantastic as a concept. And I really wish I could be there to see that because honestly, it's literally what the industry needs, right? To kind of like infuse a bit of that freshness and you way to look at things. Of course, you've seen that um, there's some of the, that kind of music that is already translating in the industry where using AI, et cetera, you've got brands that are now starting to try to run their value prop through like a rapping song and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. I've seen some experimental example like this, which I thought were really good. But what are you doing? Phenomenal. <laughs> so yeah, I would love to, <laughs> would love to joke. And sorry to your question, Paolo, because I got so excited about what Monica <laughs> was doing. Um, so what was your your question? Sorry, Paolo. I'm like, which is your song? Or My you... song. My type of music song. For the fintech. <laughs> now you're in the fintech mood. When in the fintech mood? <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, I haven't even thought that far out. Um, my, you know, my way, because like Monica was saying, you know, people learn differently, right? The experimental, it's definitely one way that connects well with people because, because it connects so many different, you know, part of, you know, our being. My way actually is, is visual, you know, if you kind of follow some of my work, I'm, I'm actually a visual person. <laughs> so not just yet into cracking into a song. So I'm probably going to take some time and um, think about how I can bring my visual way of, you know, talking and bringing innovation or, or, or concept or insight to the industry with music. But yeah, no, I think um, everybody's got... Um, their own take. And I think it's it's really beautiful to see that the industry is starting to, to loosen up a bit, right? Because traditionally finance payment were very stuck and rigid kind of area. You would come, you'd have the same format, webinars, etc. So to your point with events coming back onto the scene, it's really exciting to hear that you also see different lineup and different engagement in terms of how the content information is starting to be related to people. So yeah, it's a very, very interesting era. Very soon we'll meet in the metaverse. Right, <laughs> money can be dry or exciting, and uh, music uh, can make it uh, if you like. Essentially, <laughs> now, as this is a live show, I decided to change uh, our uh, schedule. And instead of discussing guest corp, as we talked about music, I think we can talk about uh, the negative performance of the venture capitalist. Here, the song would be the Mozart Requiem for some of them, not for all of them. So, now. We saw that uh, uh, the post-pandemic world became very complex uh, uh, with uh, raising interest rates that were hitting uh, a variety of uh, sectors. Also, the banks that typically would benefit from uh, were not well positioned given the imbalances they built uh, in a world of zero to negative interest rates. That definitely impacted the evaluation of startups. Each group reported that I think he said five uh, uh, quarters in a row that uh, the evaluation declined and became uh, very low uh, this quarter, but all the quarters quarter this year uh, has been uh, in the lowering trend, uh, which uh, is uh, like indicating uh, a, a moment of, uh, if you like, great concern in terms of A, the capability of startup to raise money, B, the capability of uh, startup that raise money to rely upon the resources they thought uh, that would have been given to fund their ambitions. So how do you guys see 
uh, the situation, uh, starting from Asia, if you can, Monica, what's the perception there? What is your uh, uh, concern here or your suggestion for uh, the startup ecosystem? Yes, um, it is a tough time for everyone. Uh, so I think for the past 10 years, the whole global ecosystem, we were in an era where money was abundant. You know, like the VCs were giving money, the startups were testing, innovating, iterating, and we were measured on growth. Go innovate, acquire customers, and that's it. We'll figure out the business case in the future. And then as money has become scarce, then it's almost overnight, well, in the past three months or six months, that now the game has changed. So now VCs are not looking for high numbers and growth. They're looking for profitability. And then as startups, we the great majority of startups were not thinking of profitability. They were thinking of growth. So now all of a sudden, like the game needs to change within the startups and be like, hey, yes, we're acquiring customers. We have a good product, but what's our business model? Are we on the path to profitability? And what's going to happen is the startups that do not have a strong proposition and product and good tech coupled with a good business model and a path to profitability. They will struggle. They will struggle a lot to fundraise, basically. And then there will be consolidation or they will just like be closures. There's been closures already. And that's going, I don't think that's going to move away anytime soon. It's going to be the next year or two that we really need to focus on, on building sustainable businesses versus businesses that were fully funded by Mr. BC. Uh, now it's like we need to build a proper business. If I can also say uh, I've always been concerned uh, by the fact that the evaluation uh, in the venture capitalist world made no sense. Uh, now, why do we all have to care about? Because there's a lot of money, one way or another, which is funded by pension funds as well, that is in the, the private world for opportunities. So when evaluations are completely nonsensical, uh, the money of people in the end, because there's no institutional money, will be at risk. So now I think that uh, a reassessment uh, has been long due, might be painful, but I guess uh, is also needed. Um, however, from the city of London, Sandra, you can sense what happens there as being the capital of all yeah. of this. So what is the perception there? Well, I'd have to say, you have to bear in mind and Freddie that I'm representing the city of London. Thank you for giving me that label. But I have to say we have an additional problem here, right, that we've created of our own with the Brexit situation, right? So I think that the, the whole situations that we have here, um, it's certainly being influenced or impacted greatly by all of those multiple, you know, environment parameters that are sometimes out of the control and sometimes inflected by our, our own, right? So it is for sure challenging because of the climate, the economic climates that we're living in. But what I'm also thinking is to the point that Monica was saying, where the glorious days where you'd have a whole range of new innovative products coming, popping in and left, right, center with a really clear definitions in terms of what are they bringing more into the market to really drive, you know, sustainable growth and profitability. All of this is now being ripped apart because what we've seen is that company being extremely highly infatuated almost with the evaluation closing down almost overnight, right? So we have seen the risk and the problem that's been created with like the extreme of these situations where everybody can hop on that wagon, right? Everybody can literally come on the market with a good, I mean, up at a certain point, with a good proposition, good backing, good narration, good pitch, get a bit of a backing. And without having a clear strategy and product in line, down the line, they still get the valuation, but all of a sudden they collapse and everybody turn around and wonder how did such and such company just went down on the overnight. So I think there's a responsibility from the way the due diligence, from the way the approach to money um, is actually, you know, done within the VC space. I think there's certainly much more due diligence that are going through um, because it's certainly, you know, it, it has contributed to the crisis that we've got today and it's totally irresponsible to continue to not, you know, to kind of cast a blind eye and not address that in, in a proper way. I feel that there's also 
to the point of the profitability piece, because at the end of the day, you build a product, you need to convince um, a market, right, an audience that you've got a product suitable for them to start buying, to adopt that, that product above some other competitive options that there is there. I feel that there's also an element where the hand users, the, the people, you and me, so depending on the product, needs to be nurtured to a certain extent as well, because it has shattered the confidence when we've seen, you know, even established organizations collapsing as much as the good fancy brands that have got great valuations, great money behind them, doing all of the crazy, fantastic marketing also going on there. So we are in a place where trust and confidence is really shattered. So it goes even beyond having a great product. There's a whole um, shift education mindset mindset, that's all that needs to happen, and a real trust element between what you're selling, who you're selling to, and, and coming across as, you know, integral and having really a sustainable plan, not just the quick profit, just making money at all costs. So it is um really, really challenging, really interesting times. Uh, and as I said, partially, um, you know, with time, some of the, you know, the parameters, the crisis element will soften up, so things will get better, but that's not going to necessarily alleviate some of the, the real longer term consequences in terms of, of people, right? People, connections, adoptions, and real understanding, confidence, and trust. I think that's something, the, the human aspect of, of this, right? I think that's also coming across as um, needed repair, needed attention, and needed to, uh, you know, to, uh, to embed into the, those propositions. So it's not just product, not just money. It's also... Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, among the main important things, one thing you said that is super relevant, that is about the trust. And the audience can trust that although I'm calling for a little commercial break, the <laughs> second half of the show is going to be breathtaking and provoking. So far, we discussed Goldman Sachs, Louisa, the intelligent social media app, the money 2020 that is coming next week and the presence of Breaking Banks Europe and Monica Milares as well on stage, the negative performance of the venture capital but in the second half of the show, we start from X Corp, the new strategy of uh, Twitter. We'll discuss uh, the undiscussable default, no default uh, of uh, uh, the US banks uh, and uh, the Revolut conundrum uh, with uh, the UK regulator. Will they get a license or not? Stay with us for a few seconds of this commercial. We are getting back with more news for you. Do you want to be part of Breaking Banks Europe? Reach out and learn more about the opportunity to be featured in one of our shows. With over 1.6 million listeners and counting, Breaking Banks Europe is bound to become the place to advance critical dialogue in Europe and the UK fintech scene. Reach out on Instagram or Twitter at Breaking Banks EU or go to www.provoke.fm. Welcome back to the second half of the episode 178 of uh, News from the Fintech Front, uh, your series of breaking banks uh, dedicated to the latest news uh, on the Fintech world. And in the first half, uh, we discussed a bit about social media, starting from Goldman Sachs, uh, digitalizing, uh, uh, deal making, uh, and interactions among uh, investors uh, and uh, startup, potentially, or other companies. We talked about Money 2020 uh, being live next week uh, in Amsterdam in the presence of uh, Breaking Banks Europe and the performance of the venture capitalist. But what I want to start now is to talk about uh, one of the unicorns who is also troubled and needs to demonstrate uh, sustainable revenues, not just a small startup, which is uh, Twitter. Now, Twitter has announced a couple of things uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, Very, very recently, a few days ago, Elon Musk appointed a new CEO, Linda Yaccarino. She comes from uh, the media world, uh, most likely an attempt to if you like, please, uh, the media world that is uh, powering uh, uh, Twitter in terms of uh, putting uh, advertisements uh, out there and therefore uh, putting money into their coffers. But a few weeks before, uh, Twitter, if you have noticed, changed uh, the name uh, from Twitter into X Corp, which is most likely the intention of uh, Elon Musk to turn Twitter into super app. Now, why does this matter? It matters because if you go back 20 years ago, when the internet revolution started, uh, you notice that uh, the platform companies uh, were the winner of the internet revolution. 
Um, LinkedIn, if not Louisa soon, is the social media platform for our business interaction. Facebook is a social media platform for my personal interaction with all of you, and you can see some of my pictures from the Italian coast there. Amazon is a platform where I try to sell my books, but Twitter is um, used to be the platform for my uh, Trump paranoia. Now is the platform for my mask paranoia. There's a <laughs> book that uh, goes by without Elon Musk is something that is very controversial. Now, let's talk about this. So we are discussing here payments uh, uh, with you guys, and we go beyond that, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, the attempt here is uh, most likely uh, from Elon Musk to leverage uh, Twitter X Corp uh, to infuse that experience he had before at the beginning of the PayPal journey to turn that uh, into a money company that might then evolve into a financial super app. They didn't really declare that, but that's what all commentators are talking about. Is that uh, uh, a fair uh, ambition or uh, is there a need uh, for uh, a super app? I, I will start from uh, uh, Monica because she lives where the super app also live. She's there in the jungle of the super that we haven't seen yet in the Western world, especially in Europe. So Monica, what's your thinking here? First of all, I think Linda has the track record to make it happen. Like she is the term, well, she was the chair, the chairman because before joining Twitter of NBC Universal. And if you look at the brands that she was looking after, it's impressive. It's like all the media brands that come to your mind were under her. So he's got the woman to do the job. So that's amazing. However, she doesn't come from a financial services background, of course. And then financial services is very regulated. Twitter has, if you Google these, between 350 and 400 million users. That's insane. And 75% of the users come from outside of the US. So Twitter has the potential to be the largest financial services player across the world. The question is, can they execute in a lean manner, in a regulated manner globally? And that's where she needs to be very smart and partner up with the right companies. This is where embedded finance comes in place. She will not be able to go and get a banking license in every single country. That's mm -hmm. it. It's It just takes a lot of time. But then the what we're seeing in Asia is the super app is not just the place where I put my money. It's not just like what Revolut is trying to do. What Revolut is trying to do is like they have a financial services app and they want to try to sell everything. What's happening in Asia is the opposite. You have an app where you go and you basically chat, you go and get your equivalent to your Uber, your food deliveries, your uh, your flights, like all sorts of services. And one of the services that they have is money as such. This so is what really important, Monica, I want to interrupt you, but just to add some comments to what you just said, um, um, the reason why some of the fintech we saw in the Western world uh, um, have a hard time uh, to expand beyond their initial propositions, which typically is around uh, money movement, uh, is that they conceive a super app like a marketplace that contains a lot of financial products that people go and source from. Now, maybe that works uh, with things like uh, the crypto world, which uh, it's just fear of missing out, uh, no value for me. And at some point uh, it will fire back. But uh, in order to power up a super app, you need to have more than a marketplace for people to come. You need to have the engagement model. Now, so. in Asia Pacific, those companies that started from an engagement model was not necessarily the money piece, added the money element on that, but somehow remained closer to their uh, soul that was engaging people. And that help them creating more engagement use cases uh, that finance uh, powered up by eliminating uh, the friction. And not sure if uh, uh, somebody coming from media and marketing understands uh, that the engagement uh, is not about, you know, looking at product and buying that product it needs to be something else. But uh, 
uh, let's see what uh, what uh, these two guys, Linda and Elon, might end up doing together. Sandra, do you feel the need of a super app? Uh, you know, you've said already a really, really interesting point. I think, I mean, first and foremost, I wasn't a Twitter user, so I've never paid really. Was. Yes, because now with this plan, I'm picking an interest because I want to know what's going on, right? Because it's definitely now starting to touch into an environment and an area that I've got an interest, the super hub. So Twitter didn't interest me, wasn't something I was you know, at all following or, or, or keep keeping up with. But now indeed the announcement of that, um, you know, super hub plan certainly triggered an interest. And with, you know, not to repeat what you guys have said, there's certainly a lot of questions. Just probably a, the, a couple of points that you guys mentioned, um, to Monica's point with the embedded, um, the embedded uh, finance opportunity, I think timing is perfect today for precisely businesses that have got a great audience to leverage the rail from core expert platforms that will bring them right into that space to now start servicing different models that would involve uh, money movement. And to your point, Paul, or around the engagement, you're right. It's not just about having a product. It's by also enabling and having that, again, back to confidence and trust, people feeling that this is where I actually want to get my taxi from or my food order from, right? Because that goes hand in hand. If you think of, um, um, uh, I was going to say PayPal, Apple, when they launched the, um, the biometric, um, you know, kind of like touching in, you know, to just uh, get everything authenticated, that was, you know, kind of in the region of 2000, 2005, 2006. It was a great product, fantastic technology. Everybody could see like the, you know, the wow factor, the innovation and, and, and what that could do to people, despite them having a really great audience, great consumer through their mobile device uh, um, side of their business. It took quite some year, right, to migrate existing consumer that have got absolute total loyalty and confidence in the product to get them to start using this whole fingerprint technology that we are now all getting used to and actually asking for, you know, to be replicated across everything. COVID was a huge accelerator for that. So this is, again, another prime example in terms of great concept. I think what Twitter's trying to do, I am definitely want to follow up, but it's going to take quite, you know, uh, some work and, and some milestone to get to a level that, because it's Twitter, people are actually going to buy and use this as their preference app. You know, there's, there's a huge gap to get there, <laughs> I feel. So while uh, uh, people decide uh, if they will want to go there or not and trust uh, Twitter to do more in terms of uh, their financial life, uh, bankers uh, are also thinking how they go on digital. And that's not easy. And um, some banks uh, acted uh, more uh, um, speedily than others. Uh, and uh, the world now is uh, showing that uh, if you lost the time, you lost a lot because mm -hmm. there is a financial downturn. So uh, more time might be needed and less time is given. The news, uh, I guess, of the week uh, is that uh, there is no news uh, after the weekend. <laughs> so the financial system uh, is so far uh, so good uh, in place. I had the chance of um, being on stage uh, at the uh, Bank for International Settlement, uh, Settlement uh, um, Innovation Forum uh, a few weeks ago in Basel. And uh, I was speaking in front of this uh, uh, panoply of uh, central bankers and uh, top regulators, and I decided to be, be provocative because there was an elephant in the room. We were not discussing much about uh, Credit Suisse uh, and SVB and uh, the banking run, and also due to the access to money and account uh, through digital technology. So what I told them is the point of view of some of the bank clients have been uh, in the capacity to interview recently for our Cloud Council, they told us that the next systemic crisis might not be um, coming from finance, like securitizations, but maybe operational. And when it's operational, it's about technology, because while the world is closing down a bit more, banks are opening up, open banking, and by the finance way more, that creates new vulnerabilities. But then I told uh, these top bankers that apparently the bankers got jealous from my point of view, so they decided to start a new systemic crisis that may come from finance. But again, this has been nuanced because it's finance and technology. So now there was an intersection between Twitter, sharing information, the capability to access money and to move money very fast that might have created uh, uh, if you like, a new modality of uh, the uh, potential impact of a banking run uh, hitting the sustainability of a financial system. 
this intersects the topic of the CBDCs uh, and the pros and the cons, the concerns. Um, I'm looking at Monica first because uh, when listening to the central bankers, um, and on the table, there's a clear difference between the Europeans and the others. Ms. Lagarde, while she was very favorable in terms of the CBDCs, was very concerned about the privacy, the role of the central bank being underneath, not to the front, while central bankers coming from Singapore, Malaysia, were way more, if you like, inclined to believe that a central bank might have a more direct role in the distribution of CBDCs also to the retail. What is the sensation there in, in Asia? Is there a discussion around all of this? Yes, there is tons happening in Asia. When it comes to fintech, the region is just booming. Specific to CBDCs, there is a lot of collaboration between the countries. That's what I've seen a lot in Asia, like cross-country collaboration. So the governments are working like across the region to make this happen. There's a lot of pilots going on. There's a lot of conferences, like there's a lot of discussion going on. So I think overall the region is very supportive. So digital crosses the borders. Eh? And, and what Love about the city of London that created a new border? <laughs> you know, exactly the same thing. Discussions quite a lot. Um, I haven't yet seen, um, because CBDC is not necessarily um, one of the area that I'm closest to, but I haven't yet seen um, some sort of meaningful you know, project um, sort of kicking in and taking precedence, you know, with regards to the various different payment priorities that, you know, the, the industry is, is focusing on. There is, um, you know, here we very much at the verge to start looking into the PSD3, right? If you're familiar that here, there's a real mandate in terms of how collectively the industry is trying to promote competitivity and, and look at some of the, you know, gaps and, and issues that we've got with the current system. I'd like to believe that um, it's probably going to have a much more prominent, you know, place within those conversations because they actually starting to go beyond just looking at a banking only perspective, but really starting to invite the contributions and that collaboration from the regulator or the related business that actually play an advocacy role within, you know, uh, those sorts of framework, because there's going to be um, quite a lot to cover off, you know, from designing, piloting, launching, to educating, testing, getting the right adoption, etc. So conversation, absolutely a lot happening, a lot of um, ha headline, I would say. I mean, the UK was saying probably a few months or so ago that they wanted the UK to be seen as the, the, the potentially uh, prime, you know, European-ish locations where, you know, we, we are kind of leading with the whole digital currency. But yeah, as I said, I am not necessarily aware of any meaningful projects um, and get, gaining traction. Certainly happening with the right stakeholders, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, not more than that, that I'm aware. Uh, I don't know if you are a royalist or not, uh, but talking <laughs> few days ago, we all watched the crowning uh, of King Charles. Uh, and in a few days, we might see the crowning or the decrowning of Revolut, uh, <laughs> one of the top uh, European <laughs> and UK unicorns, which leads me to the last news that I want to discuss uh, with you guys, uh, which is uh, Revolut uh, applied uh, late compared to other neobanks uh, for a banking license uh, in the UK and uh, not sure whether they will get it or not. Now, I'm typically a sober and substantiated uh, researcher and commentator, but I'm also provocative from time to time. And I remember when I published my second book of five, The FinTech Innovation, um, the first commentator on Twitter that was the founder of uh, RoboAdvisor said, this Paolo Cironi is strange because he says that uh, regulation is the engine of innovation. And I remind everybody as it is, in particular, because uh, as innovation is not just about technology, it's about how people work and their incentives, starting from the top of a company, especially a bank, only the regulators have the capability to help the system moving forward in a way that we're not just disrupting, but we're building a new sustainable system, financial ecosystem that uh, basically can power uh, a sustained uh, transformation of uh, the way we access uh, and use the money. That doesn't mean that regulation is perfect, uh, but there is also a need for regulation. Now, 
Revolut got into the midst of quite a few troubles recently, being fined for a variety of uh, lack of compliance reasons. Uh, they're also operating uh, uh, cross borders. Uh, they have other issues like in the US. Uh, um, they uh, apparently um, had a credible concern as they delved into very risky assets, uh, uh, playing the fear of missing out of the crypto, I guess, uh, trying to prop up some revenue, not sure that is uh, good enough. Uh, Long-term strategies are not short-term revenues, so they can be at odd and you pay back. Would that concern regulators or not? We'll see what happens uh, uh, in a few days. So Sandra, you're there. You live and breathe uh, next to the Revel saga. Yes. Uh, the sense, the sentiment in the street uh, there uh, on, on bank. I mean, first of all, um, out of all the new bank, Revolut is the most established here in the UK. Um, they have definitely managed to, you know, sort of migrate the traditional um, consumers that would, you know, rely on the bank to their service. I am myself a, a great um, believer user of their services. So I think what's really been interesting is um, if you look at, um, you know, it's, it's it's one of those interesting use cases, right? When you talk about neobanks, Revolut is the one that kind of come across a lot. So from a UK perspective, of course, there's a lot of um, things at play here, right? So the fact that the UK and Europe are now split, of course, Revolut has got their licenses in Europe, and we've seen how that impacted the, the growth of their revenue. So from a UK perspective, there's the element where it's a third of their revenue when you look at the total profit comes from the, the UK, the two other third, of course, you know, from the, the rest of Europe. There's an accelerated, you know, opportunity for them to be granted the license to start offering more product, hence the credit, the loan type of product that would definitely have a, an impact, a good impact in, to, in terms of the revenue flow. So to your point with the crypto piece, uh, the trading aspect, so those numbers have actually you know, plummeted, they've gone down. Um, what's really sustaining the business is things like the trades, the currency, because they're huge, right, in terms of the effects, uh, the currency side of things. So it's almost, um, you know, to the point we were talking about the VC part and, you know, the, the focus on profitability, it's a huge bearing on the prospect of that continued, you know, growth and, you know, hitting the profit the profitability mark that they, the ambition. But I think here it's becoming even a little bit more political to the point that Monica was making earlier on in the sense that, you know, it's uh, one of the biggest, greatest use case here in terms of neobanks. Uh, do the country and the user want to see an exit of, uh, of Revolut? Probably not, you know, it's 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 a it's a business model that is starting to really get ingrained and that of course I've gotten now a lot of competitors. But um, you know, it's kind of probably a little bit too political uh, beyond the obvious that we know related or you know portrayed through the press in terms of what's really going to come out. But I'd love and I'd like to think that the there's a big stake from both parties, right? From regular to pull out of the UK market and equally from the UK to not look at a workaround to still get the compliance element that will give them the confidence or, or the reassurance to grant that license, right? So that can be bypassed, but I'd like to think that it's not so much of a, Oh, we have the verge where, I mean, I'd like to think, that's personal opinion, that it's not like, okay, they're literally going to go tomorrow. I still think both parties have got way too much invested interest to try to make it work. <laughs> so. so, Monica, uh, will you move uh, your fintech uh, uh, ambitions to Frankfurt? Will Revolut move back to the continent? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> so, I think Revolut, they've had a history as well. It's not the first time that they are in trouble. A few years ago, yes, they are the big innovators. They are very aggressive. They dominate the world. Everybody loves them. But at the same time, a few years ago, they were on the papers because the company culture is not ideal, let's say. And then a few years later, we have senior management leaving constantly. And then that starts to kind of raise questions. Mm -hmm. They are the largest fintech let's say in the UK, and now they are ready to submit their, their accounts and they are late. They submit late and it's inaccurate. Yes, so, auditor were not complacent and they spoke out. So it makes you wonder. I'm, I'm just putting the question out there and I love them, right? I love them, but it, it does make you wonder. So on the other side, you have the regulator 
And Paolo, just like you, I'm a big fan of the regulator. The regulator is here to help the industry innovate and grow while protecting customers. They are doing their jobs well, and they have very capable people. It's not an easy job. It's not an easy job. So if they have questions, like, <laughs> it's not questions from uh, unexperienced people. It's questions from the regulator in the UK, where many countries across the world, when it comes to regulation, they look at the UK as the standard of excellence. So if the standard of excellence in the world for fintech is going to lower their standards, compromise, and this may be controversial, right? But it's like, are they applying the same standards, excellent standards to give this banking license? Mm -hmm and continue to look after the future of the country, the, the industry, customers, protecting people's money. Fair point. Can we... It's an exceptional there. We want value, not exceptions, uh, if I can say. Yeah. Now, I want to thank you for the amazing conversation about what was new in the fintech world uh, in this amazing uh, episode of Breaking Banks Europe, the number 178. We discussed uh, Goldman Sachs. We talked about the negative performance of the venture capitalist. And we discussed Elon Musk and the new CEO of Twitter without forgetting the transformation of Twitter into X Corp, potentially, and super app. We also looked at uh, what did not happen, and not just what happens, so that we have a complete picture of the world. And we ended uh, with the story about the crown of uh, the UK shaking again. So I thank you all for uh, uh, being part of uh, Breaking Banks Europe, especially our amazing audience that has been with us for the whole episode and will continue following uh, Breaking Banks Europe. In particular, I invite you all to reach out to the Breaking Bank folks, which will be in the crowd at Money 2020 Europe in Amsterdam next week. Thank you for being with us. And that's a wrap. Thanks for listening to Breaking Banks Europe, a Provoke Media podcast in cooperation with Fintech Stage. Don't forget to tweet us out, shout out, or post to the team at Breaking Banks EU on Twitter. If there's something or someone you'd like to hear on our cast, let us know. See you next week on Breaking Banks Europe.